everybody, and welcome to another fabulous episode of The Space Show Show. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Frost, joined as always by Admiral Carrie Jackson. Helmsman Herman Hemsworth joins us on the bridge today. Hermie. Um, <laughs> aye, aye. And Commander Robert Neal um, is having some issues with engineering. He will beam in shortly. Um, He's got to eject the warp core. He's got to do something <laughs> sciencey. Well, that's your answer for everything. Warp Eject core. The warp Eject core. it. <laughs> uh, hey. Before before we begin, I just want to, as today we're recording on March 20th, I just want to say a quick happy birthday to our favorite Q, John Delancey. Happy oh. birthday, John Delancey. How old is he? Old enough. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> and we're John we're two days away from De Shatner's Lancey. birthday. Yep. Here, let me uh, let me go. He birth is John Delancey is seventy six years old. Okay. Here's wowie, a something. Wowie. Here's a little something for Delancey. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to John Delancey. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. There you go. Yay. <laughs> um, what's also speaking of William Shatner, I today March twentieth, uh, William Shatner's documentary "You Can Call Me Bill" comes out on Friday the twenty second. But today on the twentieth, they're doing kind of like a Fathom event type thing where. Uh, they're showing the documentary and then doing a live Q&A that'll be simulcast across the country after William Shatner's movie about himself, you guys, is two hours and 36 minutes long. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Please don't tell me Shatner died. <laughs> There's probably a 17-hour director's cut out there. But also, <laughs> learning that today is also John Delancey's birthday... He had to do this on purpose, right? Well, it's to, had to be a to, to take to, uh, to take yeah, it away to from Q to take away from Q. You, I don't think Kirk and Q shot. ever met unless it was I in know. a book or something. I know, right? but I think William Shatner thinks he owns Star Trek. No, I don't and think so... Shatner's aware of anybody outside of the Shatner. <laughs> exactly. There's no maybe, other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe I've been spending too much time looking up Kate Middleton theories. That's it. But uh, <laughs> Shatner saying happy birthday. There you go. John Delancey. John Delancey. So, I today, still sign his name in every guest book I go. Every William event. Shatner or John yeah. Delancey? No, oh. William Shatner. <laughs> since since I was nineteen, I've I've perfected William Shatner's signature and I sign it in every guest book at every hear, event I go to. You hear that eBay? Yeah. You hear that eBay? It could be a Lee George Kate original. That wedding registry that you have with Shatner's signature might have been <laughs> Ideal, me. Ideal, Neil. <laughs> yeah. God dang it. Somebody did sign, because we had at my wedding, we had these whiskey barrel heads that use as our guest books. Mm -hmm. And somebody did sign it. Um, I'm sorry I missed my chance. Sebastian Stan. Dying to know who that was. <laughs> Unless Sebastian Stan was uh, there at my wedding. He was he, there. He was there, and then it started raining, and he ran, because he's yeah. made yeah. it. Because he's made of sugar, and he was. Oh, God. <laughs> he also said, "He has said, I'm not man enough to hold this tent down. You take it, Lee. Damn right. That is true. That <laughs> is true. It was that was an ap apocalypse wedding. Anyway, that was. Let's talk about some Star Trek. We're going to be talking about these next generation episodes: The Offspring, Sins of the Father, Allegiance, Captain's Holiday, Tin Man, and Hollow Pursuits. And before we talk about any of these, I'm just going to say, when we get to Allegiance and when we get to Tin Man, I am not going to give a about those episodes we won't be spending much time on those at all now no but let's but, talk about star trek's poor things the offspring after returning from a cybernetics conference to the enterprise data creates his own child much to the chagrin of his captain and without regards to the ramifications with starfleet um starfleet seems very loosey-goosey on creating ais and creating life forms because sometimes they don't care, and other times they really care. And this seems to be a time where they really care. So Data goes to a cybernetics conference. This is also the day to talk about the danger of conferences. Data mm -hmm. goes to a cybernetics conference and returns with uh, the android Lau, which he considers his child. He used the techniques learned at the conference to transfer his neural pathways to Lau and duplicate them in Lau's positronic brain. This was not possible earlier and is entirely new technology and untested. Uh, Jean-Luc Picard, 
is appalled to say the least he I, even I, I don't like children all <laughs> kinds of children I... <laughs> he even he even says something to the effect of i would have liked to have been consulted to which data says i have not observed anyone else on board consulting you about their procreation captain that's what i liked about this episode was whenever <laughs> somebody said you should not be doing this and he was always pointing out hey nobody <laughs> Else when you humans else. do it, no, but I mean, you guys congratulate each other. But when I do it, it's an issue. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Data argues uh, uh, he didn't see anyone else taking permission. Picard is also worried that Data's work and creation of a new life will have serious ramifications within Starfleet. Data argues that, like all living beings, he also felt the need to perpetuate himself. Until now, he was the last of his kind, but no more. Uh, meanwhile, Lal is allowed to choose, advised by Data and Troy, its own gender and racial appearance. Again, time is a flat circle, and here we are discussing the merits of gender choice and fluidity and... Don't bring your woke politics into my <laughs> Star Trek. Although Troy, <laughs> although Troy does say that you'll make this decision and it'll stick with you forever. Mm, ah. That is true. That is that true. That is true. Um, Law takes on the the appearance of a female human. Um, they take her to the holodeck to help her try out various personas, and this is the one that she likes best. And Data refers to Lala himself as family. Uh, Data and the others find educating and refining her software fascinating, but she makes progress no one anticipated, including um, contractions. She speaks with contractions, which is something that famously Data cannot do. Mm -hmm. Um she is essentially becoming sentient like data and starts to ask about her purpose in life she starts to ask a lot of questions about everything and data decides that it is best that she attends school so data puts her in school to learn social interactions the other kids make fun of her the older kids make fun of her while the younger kids are afraid of her um there's even a moment where they're in the elevator where she talks about how um they were they were laughing and data has to go or, uh, Data says, oh, people laugh, you know, because of humor. And she goes, oh, I appear, it appears I have mastered humor. And Data, <laughs> out of pure jealousy, I can only imagine, says, they were laughing at you, not with you. And yeah. <laughs> we all remember how badly his comedy career tanked with Joe Pesci. Yeah, that's right. Well, not, He's not still... Joe Pesci. Who was that? <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Piscopo. Piscopo. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I... There's so many things I love about this episode, and it's and it's all dialogue stuff. It's all dialogue stuff. I just love it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the line is so. Without understanding humor, I have somehow mastered it. And she has this like smug look on her face, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> but then Data, of course, out of jealousy, is like, no, they were laughing at you, not with you. And uh, anyway, so Data seeks advice from Beverly, who tells Data to share his own experiences with Lal. And Data realizes that he is incapable of love, which. When you say it like that, it sounds really brutal. But when you you know look at it scientifically, he is an android. And at least he's aware of the fact that he is incapable <laughs> yeah. of love, unlike most of the human race. <laughs> so he takes her out of school and sends her to the mines instead to go work at 10 Forward with Guinan. Because if there's anywhere to learn about the human condition, it's at 10 Forward. It's a right? bar. Yeah. It's that's, a bar. You want to learn about the human race, go to a bar. I mean, that's usually <laughs> my answer, but <laughs> my I'm parents just... did that when I was 14. They sent yeah. me to work at the bar and I did good. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I remember when I was in. So back when I was in elementary school, Green Street was still around. I don't know if you guys remember Green Street. Uh, yes. But I would ha I would have to go after school, first, second, kindergarten, first, second grade, walk over to Green Street and hang out at Green Street until my dad could come pick me up. I'm wow. essentially loud, you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so while she's at the bar, she learns um, about kissing and, uh, <laughs> first of all, is very confused and uh, concerned. Uh, and then Guinan is like, no, 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 it's, this is what humans do. So then Riker, of course, shows up and he's like, hey, who's the new, who's the newbie? To which I'm like, Riker, no. Tss, tss, tss. And I think that's it's a new a baby. shirt. It's a baby. I think that's a new <laughs> shirt we should add to our rotation is uh, hashtag justice for Janice and then uh, Riker no, because I find <laughs> yeah. myself shouting that a lot. I like, like a it. little spray bottle graphic on it. Uh, our, oh, our friend Robert had beamed in and then he beamed right back out. No. Oh, okay. um, oh, restore the buffer. Hold on. Beep, beep, <laughs> uh, so 
she pulls Riker in for a kiss and Riker is runs away the hot second he learns that that's data's daughter Riker, who has been away this is his first time returning to the enterprise in a while and within five minutes he gets just a book's worth of exposition dumped upon him and he is immediately like nope i cannot deal with this right now i've only been here for five minutes i leave the ship for half an episode and this is what (laughs) happens uh lao realizes that she can never feel human emotions and questions data about his attempts to emulate humans since it will only serve to remind them that they are inadequate (laughs) Uh, Word gets back to Starfleet uh, about Lal, so Admiral Anthony Haftel comes to investigate, and he's impressed, but he wants this unique specimen removed from her parent. Picard argues that Lal is not a research project, but a child of Data. He offers both Data and Lal to be kept together. Uh, But Starfleet policy on the matter of Android research is very clear. Picard tells Data that they will have to relocate Lao to a more appropriate setting if he does not find Lao's training adequate. Data is offended that his parenting skills are being questioned. He argues <laughs> As with that there every are... parent, every parent. Yeah. <laughs> he argues that there are many things that Lao can only learn from Data, such as his unique experiences and the mistakes that he's made. Haftel is not pleased that Picard is taking, talking about Lal and Data as if they are a family of some sort. Haftel argues that Lao represents a significant step towards the development of artificial intelligence, and he's not wrong. Um, it's such a technological leap forward that it should be studied in controlled procedures and effective isolation instead of poor things in her way around the enterprise. Yeah. Uh, have to find Lau serving as a cocktail waitress and 10 forward, but data argues that this is an excellent opportunity for Lau to observe human behavior. Mm-hmm. Haftel interviews Lal directly and suggests that Starfleet facilities on Galar 4 will provide a better environment for her upbringing. Lal contests and she says that Data is her father. Picard suggests that Haftel ask what she wants as she is a free and sentient being. Again, this is measure of a man all over again, but with a, a childlike woman instead, mm-hmm. right? Um, and she says that she wants to remain with Data. Uh, Lal tells Deanna that she is scared. An unusual concept for an android to feel because... They shouldn't feel feelings. Um, Haftel again asks Data to release Lao to him. He refuses. He orders Data, and Picard steps in and tells Haftel to get out of town. Because there's one thing we love about Picard. He's going to defend his crew members. Uh, but because of the fear, an emotional uh, malfunction, essentially, um, Lao dies. Her neural pathways overload and eventually collapse. Her brain is dying as the pathways cannot be revived. And Data says goodbye to Lao as she dies. Um, just, uh, just incredible stuff here, right? A lot of great stuff in this. You know, again, it's uh, you know, this darn woke Star Trek. Hey, kids, it's always been this way. Uh, mm-hmm. It's they're, 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 and again, the great parts of this episode are are the character stuff and the the dialogue back and forth. There's so many great little moments all throughout the whole thing. Uh, Picard too, you know, even, even he gets some great stuff in here. So that's why I like this episode. This all the, in, the character interaction that we get. It's just brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, Commander Robert, you've made it. Can we hear you? I, I hope so. Yeah, well, we can hear you. Can you hear us? I can. Awesome. I'll um, move your mic just like a teeny bit away. We um, had to move you. We had to reintegrate the transporter buffer to get you back. Yeah. There we go. Well, there's a problem with the pattern enhancers on Starbase 434, so. You went to oh. 434? I did. <laughs> that yeah. shithole. I had I, a. It wasn't my choice. It. it was an assignment. Never seen it. I had an old Scotsman stuck in my pattern buffer. I mean, you, know, you had the same problem. Um, I don't know if you guys have covered this or not, but Picard's reaction to Lal originally, the I wish you'd consulted me thing. Yeah. So watching that, my thought was dick. And then I realized (laughs) one thing as the episode went on further was that he's looking at it not from the, you know, I wish you would talk to me and consulted me on it so much as as your commanding officer. This is something I need to know so that I can protect you from guys like this dick. Yeah. I'm sorry, this dick. Admiral okay, uh, okay. Hafty. So it, it was like, and it's something that I didn't think about until two thirds of the way through the episode when Picard is then defending after his vehement arguments against why would you do this? How can you consider this a child, etc. When he started talking to the Admiral and the Admiral's like, so we're going to take her and Picard's like, I don't think that's a good idea. And you can see him coming to the realization that I need to defend my crewman and his choices mm-hmm. the same way I would defend any other crew person. There you go. And, that, and it, was, it was fun to watch. 
that's definitely how I um, interpreted it when Picard was like, man, I wish you would have consulted me about this first. Not that like, hey, do I think you are capable of raising a child? It is it is exactly that of, man, I need to know everything that's going on on my ship. And you kind of did this behind my back. And I just need to mm -hmm. know what's happening mm -hmm. on my ship. Um, some trivia for this episode, Whoopi Goldberg successfully fought to change a line of her dialogue. Um, it's the scene where Guinan is teaching Lyle the facts of life from... The line was, when a man loves a woman, to when two people are in love, thereby reinforcing oh. the belief that in the 24th century, a person's sexual orientation is unimportant. Um, there you go. Drug politics in my... <laughs> keep it out of your Star Trek. <laughs> this is also um, the directorial debut of Star Trek actor Jonathan Frakes. There is a whole reason he is barely in this episode. It right. is because he wanted to spend more time behind the camera. And this is also the first Star Trek TV episode to be directed by an actor from the show because um, Nimoy and Shatner both directed movies and not episodes of ah. the original series. There you go. So love that. Love that for him. Let's move on to the next episode, Sins of the Father. A Klingon commander comes aboard the Enterprise in an officer exchange program initiated by Starfleet, much to the chagrin of the crew. Um, Tony Todd. <laughs> this is uh, a friendly reminder of the, the exchange program. I was honestly so excited to see the return of the exchange program that it wasn't just like a one-off thing where we send a human onto another ship, but instead we're bringing a Klingon onto the Enterprise. So Commander William T. Riker is charged with hosting Klingon Commander Kern, who takes his place as first officer as part of an exchange program. As expected, his ruthlessly authoritative command style gets on everyone's nerve, and the worst is yet to come. Kern makes everyone works double shifts and is especially tough on Wesley and Worf. Worf, I can understand because we'll learn a little bit about that later, but Wesley, mm -hmm. come on. Guy's just a kid. Uh, That's a why. You got a child on your bridge? Yeah, kid on the bridge. <laughs> That's why. That's I just I, I do love that half of how he's so hard on Worf is by being ruthlessly kind to him. <laughs> <laughs> like 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 yeah. a like an extremely obedient puppy. Instead of being a dick to him, it's like, oh, by all means, take the day off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh Riker asks Kern to like chill out a little bit but Kern is very adamant about running things his own way um, if you had been a Klingon I would have killed you for even suggesting this oh yeah that was that was a great line there's yeah. a whole there's a whole scene too where they um are eating human food right and kind of educating Kern about human food um and the thing and he Kern is like meh, meh, like I've had, I've had butter um <laughs> and they try to sway him with caviar as if caviar is going to be the thing to entice someone over to human food. Um, it didn't entice I've also, me. <laughs> I've also seen Riker make eggs and not season them for the entire crew. So, like, I have no doubt that this Wait, food is possibly extremely bland. <laughs> I was told he had a practiced hand. I mean, and I and don't. I. And, no, and, did he and, have a practice hand, or did he say that he's noticed that that Uta had a or Yita had a? Practice no, hand? It was, that was Pulaski. Oh, have you have a practice hand, hand Commander. <laughs> I mean, did, I'm sure the writers had to have given a little more thought to. Well, caviar is fishy smelling and salty. Maybe a Klingon would and like it. And the height of luxury. How could one say no to caviar? Although maybe in the Trek future, it's yeah. not the height of luxury. Ugh, just eat a bowl of capers or something. Uh, yeah, he would have. He would have loved capers. <laughs> or kelpie. Uh, and he would have just like Bobby Lee said the immortal line, "I can't believe that I've taken advantage of not having capers all my life. What have I done without capers?" <laughs> There's a moment when they're all having dinner too. They're sitting around, and Kern is like, "This food it just doesn't agree with me," and. Jordy says it seems to agree with Worf and Kern gets this look on his face like are you really gonna bring this up like right now <laughs> that mac and cheese looked good though <laughs> it was just such a brutal line and yeah. Jordy did not have to go that hard so no. after dinner Worf confronts Kern and says that Kern has dishonored him at every opportunity and Kern reveals himself oh. to be oh. Lieutenant Worf's younger brother Mind blown, ha, ha, uh, huge revelation in the Warp of Earth. Just don't say his name three times. <laughs> he, That's he only in the mirror. Was, 
Yeah. <laughs> he was left behind with his uncle while Worf and his parents, adoptive parents, went to the outpost at Katomer. Uh, when Worf's parents died, uh, or no, uh, he, Worf and his parents went to the outpost at Katomer. When then, when Worf's parents died, the Klingon High Command simply assumed that Kern had died with the family. Kern demands that Worf join him in dealing with the blood feud, as their late father's honor is challenged by accusations of treason to the Empire by being in league with Romulans during the bloody attack on the outpost. Charges are made by Duras, son of Worf's father's greatest rival. So we got some family drama going Not on. Not the best Duras. <laughs> no, that's the, the first Theros. Oh, he has a couple of sisters that you'll enjoy. Uh -huh, oh, oh. Uh, in Klingon tradition, the family is responsible for a person's actions. So if War fails in his challenge as the eldest son, uh, his challenge is to make he will be executed. Picard decides to be at Worf's side when he makes the challenge. And I love this about Picard because this is not the first time he's done this, right? Where he is like, I will set aside my duties as a captain to be your friend and assist you in this thing. Uh, the Enterprise sets course to the Klingon First City, where Picard fears legal and diplomatic repercussions. At the Klingon High Council Hall, Duras accuses that Moch... Moch? Am I saying this right? Moog. Moch. Moog. Son of Mog. Moog. Oh, Moog. you're talking about Worf and... Worf's, Worf's dad. father? Yeah. Moog. Worf's it's, it's Moog. dad. <laughs> Moog. Moog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sent the Katomer access codes to the Romulans, which allowed them to bypass the security matrix placed on the outpost. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's name. Another High Council chairman calls a recess and advises Worf to drop the challenge and retreat. The ruling has no implication on Worf's career at Starfleet. He says that Worf should leave the past and protect the present, and the challenge will be forgotten if he goes. Duras finds out that Kern is another son and has, attacked him, has him attacked and badly injured. Uh, data finds indications that Klingon records were doctored. Klingons had captured a Romulan ship whose logs provided more info on their attack at the outpost. And Intrepid was the closest Starfleet vessel who was monitoring the situation at the outpost. The logs from the Romulan ship and the Intrepid match, but they go out of sync at the precise moment when Moog was supposed to have transmitted the codes to the Romulans. This looks like a fabricated entry in the Romulan logs. Data speculates that the fabrication took place possibly at Klingon High Council level, so the Enterprise crew sets out to find the truth. You guys, I've been reading so much Kate Middleton stuff lately. That... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to see these connections. <laughs> yes. There's no connection. There's no connection. I sent Robert this. I sent Robert this tweet the other day about how I finally understand Trumpers because the media is lying to us. There's a grand plot afoot, and I don't know who to trust. And I'm feeling that right now uh, with the Klingon High Council. Oh, I see. Okay. Beverly <laughs> finds that a Klingon woman named Coleste has also survived and was treated at Starbase 24, and she is on the Klingon home planet. Picard seeks her out. She agrees to cooperate and is brought to the High Council, and uh, but she is sent away when nobody even bothers to hear her testimony. And well, she which did sucks. call the the High Chancellor a fatty. <laughs> but she, she did but she first they had to really convince her to come because she was like i yeah. do not want please no and they were like so and so gerard's gonna be there and she's like oh that fucker? Oh. okay oh, all right. yeah. <laughs> i'll be right there and she didn't even um, come out like you know she can fight right and the card yeah. cards out like dispatching assassins on her front stoop and she's all like oh, not bad off older <laughs> so um, it is revealed that Duras's father, Gerard, the fatty, uh, is the one who colluded, but Duras's family is powerful, and so someone had to take the blame, and Worf's family has taken the blame. Picard refuses to sacrifice Worf and Kern, even though the Klingon High Council knows the truth, but they cannot allow a civil war for the honor of a single family. And so this moment in the episode is really something, because... You have a cultural, like a cultural tradition that they that they are trying to uphold, while also you know recognizing that hey, this is a fabrication, and so that it, this is the whole lie, right? Of like we cannot sacrifice, we cannot even begin to risk a civil war just because you want to clear your name. Like right. you being you taking the fall is kind of for the greater good, and I know that sucks. But Klingons gonna cling on, right? And Warp yeah. is like, absolutely not. It's the same reason why he wouldn't donate his DNA to save a Romulan, right? Like yep. He's got a code of honor and he's willing to die for it. So Worf says, he even says that, I'm willing to die, just let my brother go. And Duras is like, absolutely not. And so what is a fate worse than death? 
being exiled from Klingon society. Yep. And so Worf is like, fine, exile me as long as my brother gets to live. And so they all turn their back on Worf and Picard takes him away and the episode ends. No, this is no talking afterward, no lesson learned, no, no uh, this, this take is... a day off, Mr. Worf, none of that. No, just like, sorry, you have lost your culture and your heritage uh, and your family all in one sorry day. Sorry about that whole family name and culture thing. Sorry ah, about that. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, like, this is huge, right? Like, this is insanely huge. Here, here, have a candy. That'll help. <laughs> So is this the point where I mentioned that watching this episode and then last night going to see American Society of American Negroes has a very odd confluence? Really? <laughs> oh. Did Guinan show up? <laughs> no, but just one of those cultural, the, 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 um, the cultural aspects of we finally get Worf in a Klingon culture, you know, fully, you know, yeah. on Kronos in the council chambers. And he's like, being, he's showing everything that we have seen for two and a half seasons of I'm a Klingon. It's all about honor and duty. And uh, then they just kind of go all, all over him. And then watching this movie last night, it was like, oh, they're actually letting people know why things are not great for people of color in this country. Um, mm -hmm. And at the end of the movie, I heard somebody go, I spent $12 on this shit. And I'm like, thank you. You're that, the, exactly you're the <laughs> oh, so yeah, that that's wow. insane because that was one of the most highly sought after tickets at Sundance, by the way. Oh, really? I love the okay. movie. Mm -hmm. Um, so in an interview, Michael Dorn revealed that the events of this episode altered his perception of Worf and influenced how he played the part from then on. He said there was a lot more involved in it than the writers realized. Things that have to do with Klingon loyalty and honor. They didn't give it its due. You look at Worf in a different light, and I've played him in a different light since that episode. Mm -hmm. This is not something they have come up with. I'm doing this on my own. Hey, it's their fault they wrote it, so now I'm going to carry on with it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, spoiler alert, he does. As we go four, down the road, yeah. Four, <clears throat> four more seasons of this and about four episodes, four seasons of uh, DS9. DS9, yeah. yeah. Um, Michael Dorn has also named this episode and the Drumhead as his two favorite episodes of Next Generation. Mm. Drumhead will be coming up in the future. Uh, yes. This episode also won an Emmy in 1990 for extending art direction in a series. The award was given to Richard D. James for production design and Jim Mees for set decoration. Well, it's one of the um, first integrated matte paintings on a television show where you actually have people moving around on the matte painting of Kronos. And so it's like, that's really tricky stuff to do in a movie with a movie size budget. So here we are 1990 and they're pulling mm -hmm. it off on TV. So... I saw a really interesting conversation today about the use of the volume um, mm. and how it only looks like garbage if you're using it to recreate, if you're using it to create sets. And it, it really shines when using it to create what the matte paintings used to accomplish, right? The backgrounds, like yeah. The huge, huge sprawling backgrounds that really show the depth of an area that you are in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a conversation for well, another time. But briefly one of the things that makes it uh the volume work with favreau is that he tends to put elements of the set in the volume exactly so that yes. people are reacting mm -hmm. to something and the volume is just there to make the background like yeah. you were saying so which is yeah. why i'm excited about the acolyte because apparently they didn't use the volume i'm also they, excited because okay, they're using they... a hong kong mm -hmm. cinema director <laughs> not only did they not use okay sorry for a brief star wars talk sorry in our star trek show detour but, star in it, yeah, it works. Yeah, <laughs> show, show. not okay not only did they not use the volume they also one of their writers had not seen a star wars anything ever and so they brought in this person to be like hey we need somebody in our writer's room who's not blinded by star wars who can oh. catch things like emotional beats human interactions stuff like that and they also have they also had an intimacy coordinator on set Mm. I may am I gonna get some sex in my Star Wars, you guys? No, yeah. it's 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 fist in the face intimacy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I saw in the trailer. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Anyway, back to Star Trek. Back, back to, Star to Trek. Trek. Sorry. Um, we're just gonna quickly go over Allegiance. Picard is kidnapped no, no, and held no, to three no, different no, aliens. No, no. I I wrote a fifteen page dissertation on why this oh. is the oh. suck fest of suck fest. <laughs> Me, oh no! I want to hear it. I was gonna get yeah. comfortable. Okay, okay, let's hear okay. it. Okay, no, uh, I, I'm, uh, this right. is awful. 
Picard yeah, is kidnapped and held to three different aliens, and meanwhile replaced with a replica as an imposter captain. Uh, an escape room episode. You would think I would love this because Picard's I... trapped in an escape room with three different strangers. Yeah. Um, mm, Not so much, huh? No. So bored. Just so bored. I know a um, couple of the aliens in this episode got action figures. That's my contribution. Oh, really? I like <laughs> I liked Changeling Picard. He's like, I'm a little lamp. Ah, <laughs> fake Picard. Fake Picard. Okay, Picard, chilling in his lounge or whatever, gets beamed out and swapped out with a replica mm -hmm. Picard. Um, our real Picard is put into an escape room with a coward and a Starfleet cadet. And then uh, later on, um, an angry guy shows up. Alien. Yeah. Angry guy. <laughs> and uh, they get, air quotes, food, but they come in the shape of discs, totally inedible to the angry guy. So the angry guy's like, I'm going to eat you in three days. And so they try to escape the room, but every time they try to escape, they get zapped or whatever. Uh, meanwhile, back on the regular Enterprise, the fake Picard, um, he does a bunch of weird stuff, right? So he... Oh, hello, Beverly. Uh, How are you? Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this in just a second. Okay. So Replica Picard changes the scheduled rendezvous with the USS Hood and reduces the speed of the Enterprise. Um, and it's going to go study a pulsar in some random section. And when they get, col when they get closer, they reduce speed even further. Um, and... He Picard's also like, hey, Riker, don't uh, tell uh, uh, don't tell the USS Hood about why we're late or whatever. Um, and then fake Picard also asks Beverly to have a private dinner with him, and they kiss. He asks Deanna about the lengths to which the crew would follow him without question. He asks Jordy to improve engine efficiency um, while he was playing poker, by the way. Uh, sings a song with the crew in the bar and attends the poker games. It's like, like how many clues do you guys need? A lot. And, and, and a lot. What I and what I love about um this crew is imagine working so closely with people every day that when you notice they are just slightly off, like it raises alarm bells, right? Because Picard technically not really doing anything wrong, but the minute he started singing a song in the bar, he Riker, Jordi, and Deanna are like, they're He's never this cool. Like, okay. what? <laughs> what, what the is fuck is happening? going on? <laughs> this guy never has fun. What is happening? It's also why uh, when, when they hear him singing for a Jaka in the turbo lift, no one questions it. Because <laughs> it's the most Different boring. Jaka. That was just on Luke. I deal with Mio. Okay, so um, yeah. Real Picard puts together that this is all an experiment. Um, and the the starfleet cadet knew too much about picard's history and kind of outs herself as like a an observer of how these three get are trapped or interacting and it turns out um the aliens that have abducted these people are learning all about how authority works and how people respond to authority uh, yeah, find authority and authority always wins yeah. yeah it's it's kind of a stinker it's kind of a stinker picard kidnaps them onto the enterprise and says see that's not very fun is it and they're no, like you're no. right <laughs> so oh, don't we, do it again we have learned about authority now oh you are mean you made us stay <laughs> But okay, so so here here's here's where I get uh caught up and tripped up on this episode, right? Fake Picard has this whole interaction with Beverly, right? Hello. The real the the aliens that have abducted them, the real Picard, fake Picard, the aliens that have abducted them, they're on the bridge. Beverly not on the bridge for the whole explanation of how this whole thing went down. Be they leave, real Picard's back. Beverly comes to the bridge, shoots Picard a look. I don't know. Jean Luc. Hello. So am I to understand she doesn't know that that was a fake Picard and that their whole interaction was not real? Maybe she was into fake Picard. <laughs> I'm just saying Kinky. there's implications. <laughs> yes. Or it was, or that was that was the cue at the end of the episode for Picard's inner monologue to go. Oh, I've got to straighten this out now, don't I? Oh, ah, but oh. also, but also, does Picard know? Because the only the only person who would know about the interaction between Beverly and Fake Picard is Beverly, and is Beverly gonna bring it up ever again? She might not. She might be too <laughs> might be too embarrassed. Ah. 
anyway, the Offspring and Allegiance uh, were built with minimal sets uh, in part to balance out the series' budget after yesterday's Enterprise. The end of the, the Allegiance. End. <laughs> <laughs> Enough <laughs> said. Not memorable. Enough said. Um, I mean, I would have switched things around. I would have had Riker get kidnapped because then he would have been like, let's get busy, fellow prisoners. <laughs> yeah. Let's make out. Let's get hot. And then, this is while we're here yeah and then fake Riker would have been like let's get busy enterprise and he would have been having like huge swinging parties in his in his quarters so it would have been, <laughs> and Deanna would have been like he's never this crazy yeah whoa there's a lot of people in that holodeck suite <laughs> um <laughs> moving on to a fun episode captain's holiday after uh -huh. mediating a difficult trade agreement, Captain Picard is encouraged to take a much-needed rest on a vacationing planet where he's visited by a strange race from the future in search of a dangerous weapon. Is he um, gumpy? He's so gumpy. <laughs> he's so <laughs> gumpy. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to put out there, there's a, there's a scene where Riker's on the bridge and Deanna has returned from wherever she's been for the last couple of days. I was at a conference of some she kind. She was at whatever evil conference happens. Um, <laughs> And I w my wish for you, for everybody, is to find somebody who greets you with as much enthusiasm when you return as Riker greets Rihanna, or Deanna, excuse me. Because the enthusiasm with which he says, Deanna, welcome back. Like, I, they my hold wish hands for, for a second on the bridge. My wish for yeah. you is to find somebody who greets you with that much enthusiasm after not seeing you for a while because my god they love each other so much okay anyway I don't know so <laughs> <laughs> picard is tired you guys and, and grumpy. <laughs> he is grumpy and everyone everyone on the ship is like please take a vacation and he is like i guess i could go to the holodeck for a few hours and they're like no 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 no, no. no. That's you not what leave we're this about. place. Beverly does the thing that they do um, in the episode of Shore Leave in the original series, where she's like, I have this patient who he's showing signs of stress and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Picard's like, well, what do, what do you recommend? And she's like, a vacation. And Picard's like, oh, it's me. I'm I'm the patient. I love <laughs> the clincher, though. I love the thing that gets his ass off the ship is Deanna saying, Oh, my mother just called and said she's going to stop by for a few days and is really looking forward to seeing you, John Luke. Oh, oh, oh. A masterful gambit. <laughs> yeah. I, she, and Deanna's she all, so did smart. I do that? <laughs> <laughs> she even does this thing as like, they're, Picard's like, okay, fine. And they're leaving. And she does this thing in her seat where she's like, yes. And it's just so cute. I'm she's a so scamp. <laughs> <laughs> and Riker even tells him um, to pick up a local souvenir statue. And oh. Deanna, Deanna, in the room at the same time knows what this is doesn't correct him she's been to <laughs> Riza with Riker <laughs> the thing the thing about this statue is it signals to everybody that you are down and ready to clown and and not gump and not and, gumpy and I and, and I just gumpy. love the name I just love the name of the statue couldn't be more on the nose a horgon all right mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, but so here's Picard the thing. I can't figure out Deanna and, and Riker's relationship because he's flirting and doing all this stuff and she's just supposed to take it. Well, I, they're not in a committed relationship. You know, there was a thing. There was a thing I she, saw on But Twitter. if she does, he gets all butthurt, you know. Anyway. Well, so let's, if you want to talk about the dynamics Rall. between men and women, like well, that's another uh -huh. conversation. I, he even <laughs> said right. to Devarani Raw, "Go ahead, make her happy. I dare yeah. you." Just not but right. Anyway, there there was um, a thing on Twitter I saw going around about um, not about romantic ships, but um, we like to see relationships of people who are in cahoots, and people were sharing examples of relationships of people who are in cahoots. And Deanna and Riker are a pair who are always in cahoots. Yes, I would agree with that yeah. absolutely. Um, so Picard begins the worst vacation imaginable. All the man wants to do is read his books. My and paper people, books. <laughs> people keep coming up to him. Um, you do know what Riza means in English? No. It's planet butt cheek. Is that right? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there was a well, whole episode. Makes well, the sense. Whole butt cheeks. Makes sense. So the second Picard lands, he is 
under observation by these two mysterious aliens. Um, Jovel is a waitress at the resort where he's staying, and she is intrigued as most people come for sex, but Picard is only there for books. Um, he has been brushing off females left and right, and she is like, dude, the statue you have signals that you are single and ready to mingle. And he is like, break her. Which, which was straight... Which was strange to me because Picard is is a, is an amateur anthropologist. You think he would have been familiar <laughs> with the goings on and the people of Risa, but no, he's like uh, he's wouldn't he's, let all look up the history and the meaning like, of the thing that uh, he picked up. All that, I, yeah. I I thought he told me to pick up a Vorgon. Oh, those guys <laughs> over there. <laughs> That's different. Yeah. So a random girl named Vash, a very sexy, mysterious woman. Mm -hmm. um, she she appears she appears to be hiding from a Ferengi, and while she, she sees the Ferengi, she kisses Picard, and Picard the never do a yes and with Picard because he's not gonna do it with you. He no. he's. And he also, didn't this why. Is, yeah, he did not take also, any improv classes, no. This is also a lesson in if you are out and about and a woman, a strange woman, approaches you acting like she knows you, please go along with it. It is a safety thing because she is obviously trying to escape someone who she does not want to be with. Just putting that out there into the universe. And, and look around. Happens. All it would take is 10 seconds to realize that the Ferengi with flip-flops is up to no good. <laughs> a Ferengi there, period. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, obviously. Hey, Ferengis, Ferengis like to have fun, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I got go, oh, the Fer This episode, mm. you guys. This episode <laughs> with the Ferengi. My God. Okay, so the Ferengi approaches Picard and asks him not to get involved with this girl and demands his disc back because uh, she um, uh, has this disc uh picard picard has no clue what he's talking about um vash meets picard again and she slips the disc into his robe that is not a euphemism uh <laughs> picard is approached by the two aliens who are observing him they are from the future uh they draw him into a quest for a mythical weapon uh which was hidden in time by a mysterious time traveler uh it, the device is a quantum phase inhibitor capable of halting all nuclear reaction within a star. The device was hidden in the 22nd century uh, when it was attempted to be stolen. These two aliens are the security officers designed to retrieve it. Study of historical records revealed that Picard discovered an object matching its description on Ryza. Picard promises to give them the device uh, if he finds it. So... Picard then finds the disc on him and meets up again with Vash. Vash is a personal assistant of Professor Samuel Estragon, who devoted half his life to searching for the device. He found the exact location before he died, and the disc contains his notes and maps. He says that the location is 27 kilometers from the resort in some cave somewhere. Uh, Vash says that she plans to recover the device and donate it to science institutes for study. Meanwhile, the Ferengi Sovak tells Picard that Vash was paid to steal the disc, but she got greedy and used the money to travel to Ryza. But Picard punches the Ferengi and continues on with Vash. <laughs> they cover <laughs> 16 kilometers in a day and end up having to <laughs> end up having sex in a cave when they stop to rest. Is that her? That is yeah. her. It's a, it's a Vash action figure. She doesn't get an action figure until later, out of Next Generation. I thought she yep. had one sooner. Um, is that the only one of her? Because there's one that I've seen. This is the only one I've been able to find. I used to have it, okay. and it's it, it says it's from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. But I'm like, I I thought she was on many more episodes before that. But um, yeah. I know there's a I know that there is a uh, one of those Vash figures at a local toy shop down on State Street. If you need to replace yours. Ah, okay. <laughs> if you need to, it's just, you know just, that one down there. It's probably mine that I sold to somebody, <laughs> and they wound up selling it to the toy shop. Um, but this is also this is what this is the holiday that Picard needs. This is the vacation that Picard needs, where he gets to go play Indiana Jones, not just sitting by a mm -hmm. pool deflecting advances from hot women all the time. But he had uh, his, he had his hot little legs out. He did have his hot <laughs> in that speedo. Yeah. That shiny speedo. Yeah, what's with these clothes, man? And that and that weird <laughs> that weird bottom hemline on his robe. It's like one side's much lower than the other. Asymmet it's called asymmetrical. Yeah. The next day, they reach the location per Estragon's notes. Um, they are joined by the two time traveling aliens. Um, Sovak shows up and has a phaser and forces Picard and Vash to dig. But hours later, they cannot find the mysterious device. They conclude that the professor was wrong, and Sovak can't handle the fa can't handle the failure, and the rest leave. And so he is just stuck there digging 
until the end of time. Because he's I guess. convinced that they're lying and, mm -hmm. and you know, that the thing is there. Yeah. Uh, Picard is puzzled and gets back to the resort with Vash. The Enterprise is back in orbit around Ryza. Picard concludes that Vash had already been to the location before and had taken the device. He confronts her and she admits and reveals it. The Vorgons appear and say, come on, give us our thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Vash even says really that cops. Estragon had noted two Vorgons who tried to steal the device. Picard asks for proof uh, that they are security officers. They try to take the device by force, but Picard gets the Enterprise to destroy it from orbit if nobody can have it, right? This is this seems like it's causing too much trouble and uh, nobody, nobody can have it. Um, there's a line there's a line reading in this episode where Riker is trying to convince Picard to go to Ryza and um Riker says there's nothing to do but sit around all day and enjoy the quiet and they at the same time go the women of course the women how could we possibly <laughs> forget about the women it, and it's just one of the funniest line reads I've heard in a in a long time there's a Vorgon action figure they got an action figure oh everything got an action figure oh not everything mm. Well, yeah, not so it's from, from my Horta action figure. Yeah, there there are some that deserved action figures that never got them, and then you get the True. Vorgon, who's there once and you know gets an action figure. <laughs> and the Traveler yeah. too. The Traveler got an action figure, yeah. Um, Michael Dorn can be seen twice uh, as an as a tourist extra in the background in this episode. Oh, now I have to go back and look. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, he's the first character to appear in the episode as it starts on Ryza. He walks across the screen from left to right with a woman in red. And then as the picture zooms back, he can be seen walking towards the back of the space on the right. He's wearing a purple tank top and orange swim bottoms. He can be seen again in the scene where Vash slips the disc into Picard's tunic. Again, not a euphemism. Uh, he's hmm. sitting in a wicker chair behind Vash, Picard and the Ferengi on the right in the same outfit. Um, also, if you've read Patrick Stewart's memoir, uh, Sir Patrick Stewart had an affair with Jennifer Hetrick while filming this episode. So that chemistry is real. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Well, well. Mm -hmm. Oh, Captain, mm -hmm. my Captain. Well, you know, they seemed they seemed like they were getting along. Hachi you know? uh, yeah, because he got to live out his Indiana Jones adventure. Um, <laughs> moving on to the next episode, Tin Man. We're just going to briefly talk about Tin Man. The Enterprise reaches out to an alien being while dancing around with the Romulans who want to attack it in an act of vengeance. Here's the thing. I didn't like this episode for a, a bunch of reasons. One, I don't like know-it-alls. Two, <laughs> Romulans again. Those are my two big... <laughs> That's that's your notes. That's my notes. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so goddamn annoying. I mean, I understand uh, his. Tim, I, under, I understand his, his whole, plight, but yeah, his yeah. whole deal. He's a he's a Betazoid. He he was born with the Betazoid capabilities, where normally you develop them as you grow. Um, and he oh suffers the thoughts of of everybody all at once and i under, i get it i understand why he's the most annoying person in the world well and a good actor could have made him compelling <laughs> true <laughs> true yeah. uh anyway so he's been communicating telepathically with this like alien thing um and so they go to find the alien thing called the tin man and the romulans are also after it um the thing destroys the romulans huzzah um he jo he f have, finds himself on this mysterious Tin Man craft um, with, oh, he calls it Gom 2. And uh, turns out, you know, there used to be um, thousands of this thing. And it is now the only one left. And it has been traveling the universe for hundreds of years trying to find anybody, anything left of its kind. And it cannot. So it was heading its way to a star that was going to go Nova because it wants to die. And now it has discovered the know-it-all man and they um, are friends and they go off in the universe being know-it-alls together. Play the navigator, everybody. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I, literally, I take it. I have to take it back. The, the actor's fine. It might be the director. This uh, Harry Groner, the guy that played Tam Elbrum, mm -hmm. he was the evil mayor on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Rebecca. Yes, that's where I. You know what? I thought he looked familiar, and I was like, yeah. "Why is this guy like so aggravating?" And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Why is he so aggravating? <laughs> the Walter Peck of Sunnyvale. Yes. <laughs> um. 
some real quick bits of trivia for this episode. The sound effects for the alien ship were produced by having a stage crew member eat half a large pizza and then sit quietly with dermal microphones taped to his stomach to record the sound of his digestive process. Wow. I mean, love, I've gone to, love Foley work. I've I've gone to extremes to do Foley work, but never to that extreme. Have you guys uh, seen the interview with um, the sound guy who worked on Dune? Uh, there's an interview, a part of an interview I watched where there, he was trying to come up with the sound of the the sandworm swallowing a bunch of people. And so he couldn't find anything that worked. So what he did was he just took the mic and uh, like deep throated it himself, you know? That's commitment. That it's is very commitment. cool. Sound, sound <laughs> artists are a whole nother level. I, um, I wish I had learned how to do it. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, I've done some on my own, but nothing mm -hmm. to that extent, you know. Uh, another visual effect: the growing chair. There's a there's a scene where a chair comes up out of the ground. Um, it was created by reversing a time lapse film of a wax chair melting. Oh. And this episode was Emmy was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Special Visual Effects. Okay. Um, Cool, cool, cool. Let's talk about my favorite episode of this bunch, Hollow Pursuits, everybody. Oh, uh, <laughs> we, knew you'd, member... we knew you'd love him. Huh? <laughs> wow. wow. Okay, a shy member of the Enterprise crew becomes addicted to the holodeck where relationships are easier than in real life where his knowledge is needed in engineering. Um, we meet uh, Lieutenant Barclay. A self-conscious and somewhat neurotic new arrival on the Enterprise. He's always late for meetings and usually mumbles and fumbles his way through them when he's there. How is this man Starfleet? Just like right out the gate. How, how, I know everybody in Starfleet can't be perfect, but I'm dying to know how he made it on the Enterprise. I don't think they're going to hold somebody back who, I mean, we, we, we didn't have the, the verbiage. We didn't have the, uh, the language for the language for neurodivergence, like he's very very neurodivergent i don't think he's going to be the kind of guy that they're going to say well you know he's he's got ocd he's he's got some classic markers for autism we, we he can't be in starfleet he's actually a very capable officer once he gets out of his own way right that's the sure. thing is that once he can figure it out he's he's quite good i mean he comes up with the answer to the problem at the end of this episode well yeah. and not that people with autism can't serve on starfleet right because like data is obviously there an android <laughs> well but but he's uh, Barkley is just self-conscious and shy is, is right. the thing that, that's mm -hmm. really his thing he's just he's one of those introverts you know that isn't isn't sure of himself and and but down on the holodeck he's a hero you know he's he's everything again, he wants to be you know we've seen this before because we saw it with Jordy when he was like i can't get a date i'm going to create i'm going to recreate dr brahms in the holodeck this is kind of an extrapolation of that and we get a, you know, a full fledged other character out of it as well. So, um, but again, talking about how great a captain Picard is both Riker and, and Jordy are like, dude, can we get this guy off the enterprise? And Picard is like, no, maybe you should try harder to help him along. And I actually really respect the hell out of Picard for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Picard has good references for Barclay from captains that he has served under and is more than willing to give him another chance. And Jordy accepts him as a new project. Um, but we learn Barclay spends a great deal of time in the holodeck where he has created a Walter Mitty like fantasy world where he is the major player and those around him holographic representation of fellow crew members are his minions in the holodeck programs. He has simulated reality where he stands up to his superiors, shows his machismo, and this results in simulated sex with Deanna a lot, who is excited by this display of testosterone. <laughs> ah! Okay, uh, the Enterprise is taking tissue samples, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Barclay is having issues fixing the anti-grav platform used to transfer the samples. Jordy tries very hard to make him comfortable with his duties, but he keeps feeling that he is out of place. Uh, the Enterprise is apparently infected with a substance that cannot be scanned with normal systems. It starts with simple things like glass leaking at the bar. Data analyzes it and sees that the structure of the glass has been altered at an atomic level. This is serious since anything on the ship could have been infected. Geordi asks Sparkley to check the 4,000 power systems of the Enterprise, which he agrees as he thinks the anti-grav issue is leaked, linked to the leaking glass. Uh, meanwhile, Guinan advises Jordy that Barclay is an imaginative mind. She says that any person who feels that they are not wanted would be late and nervous around other people. 
And again, American Society of Magical Negroes needs Guinan. Well, she in she's there. got her species uh, has got that uh, empathy thing, <laughs> kind of like uh, Troy's, but not quite. But 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 she's right, and I'm so glad that they also like included this in the episode, right? Because like this is this is general human knowledge and general human advice that we should all take to heart. Um, I forgot to mention that before that scene, um, Barclay is on the bridge talking to Picard and Picard, everybody has a mean nickname for Barclay called Broccoli. And Data does this great thing where he asks them to explain the mean nickname and that makes them go, you're right, we should not call him that. Which if you're out and about with people and they're being mean to somebody else, ask them to explain it and then kind of make them realize that they're being dicks. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> Barclay is talking with Picard on the bridge and Picard accidentally calls him Broccoli. Oh. And if that <laughs> happened to me, I would throw myself out the airlock <laughs> so fast. I would never ever recover well he doesn't throw himself out an airlock what does he do he throws I mean, himself I'm back not. into fantasy yeah uh, I'm sorry so i don't it... think anybody would call you names for broccoli no. <laughs> 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 So Jordy goes out to find Barclay to be like, look, man, okay, I'm sorry. Like, let, let's let's be better about this. Um, and he finds Barclay in the holodeck, which, by the way, I don't think you should be able to just enter anyone's holodeck time. No. Right? Like, it I should can be kind like of... an incognito mode. There needs to be a lock or some kind of shit. I don't know like, what, but. I can understand why Jordy and Riker later on in the episode can just access it because they are superiors. But at the same time, I don't think it should be allowed. Did they look to see if there's like a sock on the door or anything? Like yeah. can the holodeck, like can't there just be a doorbell for, yeah. so that if you're in the holodeck, you can be like, oh, I see someone's trying to I've, get me. I should probably close all these tabs. I felt this way since Data came barging in on Picard's horsey back well, riding. Yeah. All yeah. I know <laughs> is I can guarantee you that Quark has those on the holosuites on Deep Space Nine. <laughs> Yeah. Guarantee to you. And and recording software. Yes. So oh, yeah. the camera, what's that, what's that camera doing there? I don't know what that <laughs> camera's doing there. Oh. So Jordy finds Barclay's holodeck programs. Um this one is in a Victorian era with Beverly as his consort and three musketeers featuring Data, Jordy, and Picard attacking Barclay. Um and Jordy tells Barclay that he understands his imagination will allow him to continue with his work. Um, although I, he does find it weird that Barclay recreates people that he already knows in his holodeck programs. Um, yeah, because Jordy only recreates people he doesn't know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that is true. Personally. Um, I got to tell you, the appearance of the Three Musketeers had me screaming and rolling <laughs> i what a pleasure i love to see these guys having fun when they get to just have fun and do stuff That's um cute. soon uh, <laughs> uh, the transporter starts to malfunction as well and barclay is again late for a meeting on the bridge and both riker and deanna discover the nature of barclay's programs on the holodeck because riker and deanna go with jordy to the holodeck and are like okay enough is enough um Deanna was very supportive of Barclay making fun of Picard and Riker in his programs, but then is embarrassed to see the sex dolls he has created of herself for his amusement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, suddenly, um, the ship has a velocity increase due to the Mantar antimatter injectors locking. Picard calls in Jordy and Barclay to figure it out and resolve. It is not a computer issue. The injectors are physically jammed and speed is increasing. Um, Barclay suggests that maybe the issue impacting the four symptoms are being transmitted physically. Um, it, it turns out that the thing that he dropped earlier is the thing causing the issue and they yeah. fix it and everything's fine. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about the holodeck program. Um, because, <laughs> because after all this, not only do we see our friends as three musketeers having fun, we see Beverly is like just a, a hottie who's stroking his head while he's taking a nap and Deanna standing there as a goddess ready to have sex with at any time. Um, and so they talk to him about it and they're like, hey, don't. Um, and he gives a farewell speech to the air quotes crew 
in in his holodeck saying hey thank you for all of your help and fun um bye 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 Mm -hmm. and nary an apology to anybody else that was actually affected by this i did not see an apology to deanna for using her the way that he did yeah um also would love to see it i know i'll never get it an apology from Riker to deanna because the second there was a second Riker showed up he was not okay with it but then when he saw there was a second deanna he was totally okay with it exactly you see this is my problem with Riker. um and also loved the appearance of Wesley. Uh, Hollow Wesley's appearance was based on the famous painting by Thomas Gainsborough called The Blue Boy. His yeah. costume was copied in detail and references to the painter and the painting can be found throughout the script. Yes. Um, this episode was also nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Hairstyling. And what last... say, giving Barkley a full head of hair as opposed to what he really <laughs> looks like. Is that what they won for? Oh, I... Shots fired. Uh, but also the lovely wig that Picard gets to wear. Just delightful. Yes. Uh, also, during Barclay's counseling session with Troy, he mentions that he knew about the flux capacitor and didn't need to hear about it from some damn kid. The flux capacitor was the core component of the DeLorean time machine from Back to the Future and is mentioned multiple times throughout all of the Star Trek series except the original series. Well, well because... For reasons. <laughs> yeah, 1980. Well, you know. If only they'd ever <laughs> mentioned... Uh, you know, an oscillating overthruster. I've, uh, I've only, um, yeah, I just, uh, just had a blast with this episode in particular with mm-hmm. everyone's fun costumes and getting to play pretend. Cause I just love it when they get to play pretend and do other things that aren't just spaceman stuff. I'm, yep. I'm just happy you got to re- meet Reg because yeah. his ultimate episode is coming. Oh, uh, he shows up again. Oh, he shows up a lot. A lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's not, he's not quite like Cole Meany level guest star, but no. he, he does show up. There is an amazing episode that I will not tell you anything about, but let's just say things get wacky, and mm-hmm. it's all Reg's fault. Oh uh, he also has a he also has a great scene. It's like a two second cameo in the uh, first Contact movie, um, where where he's speechless after meeting a famous person. Um, and, yeah, and I remember uh, uh, the. <laughs> well, thank you for reminding me of that scene. I just had a flashback, and I remember uh, his action figure was a limited edition of one thousand seven hundred and one. They did several mm-hmm. of those, and That's so I remember too. me and the Vice Boys, well uh, Jeff at least, and Punk, desperately searching for Barkley figures. <laughs> <laughs> um. He, he he was a big he was a big deal for a lot of us that grew up in the '80s because he was on the A Team, the actor. Yeah. Oh. And so. Okay. He, yeah, he was he was Mad Dog Murdoch, and so we, um, we we all just loved that character because he Love, was yeah. neurotic and crazy, and you know he flew the he flew the helicopters and the jets and yeah. whatever else. So. Oh, the guy from the A Team's on Star Trek! Yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do want to mention as well, so he, he deletes all of his hologram programs except Program 9. Do we know what Program 9 is? No. Don't know. No. Hmm? No. no. Hmm. I don't think we find out. I mean, we'll have to pay attention, but I don't think it comes back unless oh. it's Vulcan Love Slave. Oh, my God. And that's where Cork comes in, but that's another story. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Well... Anyway, um, anyway, that's Star Trek for this week. Uh, next week, we're going to be diving into the finale of season three, which I hear is a doozy. Uh, we'll be doozy. <laughs> talking about the most toys, Sarek, Menage Troy, Transfigurations, and the Best of Both Worlds Part 1. Um, are we ex- are we excited, everybody? Everyone everyone I've talked to is like, oh my god, you're coming up on the season three finale. Ah, <laughs> I'm excited because I re- the season three finale is the first time Trek ended with a finale oh. for a season. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they said, okay, well here's your cliffhanger. Yeah, mm. and they've done they do it multiple times from this point forward on TNG, and they really do it well on Deep Space Nine after like the third season because. Mm-hmm. third season forward of ds9 it's like okay we're just going to tell the same storyline for four years which means we have really good opportunities going into you know uh the show would run for seven eight weeks and then they'd be on hiatus for four or five weeks so they'd cliffhanger there they'd cliffhanger at the end of sweeps they'd cliffhanger at the end of the season and that stuff was great the trick was do they stick Wait. the landing when they come back 
right? Oh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Best of Both Worlds is a phenomenal and, cliffhanger. And I just and I watched the, uh, the, the part two just, just mm. the other night. They do stick the landing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, Although okay. I, 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 I'm, pr I'm going to predict wh what Rebecca's problem with the episode will be. Oh, I I'm not going to say it here, though. Oh, I want to know. There's, there's a character they very obviously did not know what to do with throughout the second mm. part. Yes. And mm. they, they, they had the character in a lot of scenes, mm -hmm. and that person just stands there, and you're like, but exactly. Yeah. She's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but she does come back. In yeah. those Peter David novels that I was talking about, the, yeah. the the new Frontier novels, she's second in command on on the Mackenzie Calhoun ship. But anyway, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't she appear again much later? And she yes. does. Yes, yeah, she comes yes. back. Yes, as an admiral. Oh, all right. Well, um, thank you guys for joining us on this journey today, and then we'll see you again next week. But until then, we will go. We continue to go where no man's gone before, but a lot of people have gone before. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>